So thank you, Chaim, uh, and uh, I really want to thank Shai and Andrew for introducing uh, essentially all the relevant topics. Uh, so it's really going to be a continuation in many ways, but from a little bit of a different perspective. So uh, you all know that uh, deep learning is, is actually considered uh, as some sort of a new phase of AI. Uh, so you know, it, we moved from the logic to the logic phase, which really didn't work, to the, to the machine learning, which was essentially statistical curve fitting, which worked somewhat. And then there is this uh, new phenomenon, which is really not new, of deep neural networks, which seem to change the, the rules of the games in some sense. And I actually consider it as a, a different phase, in, in AI at least, if not if understanding biology. It's definitely motivated by biology, but it's a different object altogether. And, and, and we know that essentially what really changed between the 80s the first connection is age in the 2000. One of the things that has a major difference is really the size of the problem. I mean, we're talking now about uh, we moved from 100 pixels images to megapixels images. We moved from uh, thousands of weights to millions of weights and, uh, or hundreds of millions of weights. And essentially, this type of uh, change in scale, at least in my opinion, it really brings back uh, the ideas that some of us uh, played with already in the 80s, which is what we call then statistical physics of, of learning, which was essentially analyzing it as an asymptotic regime of very large network of very large input, and analyze the typical behavior, not the worst case behavior. And that's something which uh, I've been pursuing for many, many years. I, I don't want to, I promise time to say different things here. Just want to emphasize uh, that uh, when uh, we talk about different, one of the main differences is really this, uh, this type of curve that uh, when we increase the size of the data, somehow the performance continues to increase or to improve, uh, whereas uh, standard old models like you know, uh, regression trees or, or uh, support vector machines to some extent and, and things which are limited in, in, in depth, uh, uh, usually saturate, and more data doesn't really improve the performance. So there is really some sort of a saturation in capacity of the models. And that's something which I think is really the, the key to trying to understand what's going on. And of course, we already heard, uh, I don't want to repeat it, I mean, so essentially the question is, is whether there is more than just high dimensional curve fitting here. And, and we just heard from Andrew very beautifully that this uh, bias variance trade-off, or essentially complexity accuracy trade-off is is something which uh, has some surprises for us. I mean, when we increase the dimensionality, somehow it violates this uh, very basic intuition that the number of parameters uh, should scale with the size of the data. The size of the data should scale with the number of parameters. It's definitely not true for deep learning. Now, my take on this question, as uh, was already mentioned, my name is, by the way, Tishbi, not Tishbi, uh, is that, uh, is to look at, uh, Deep neural network as some sort of uh, information flow processing. So essentially, if we look at the layers as single random variables, so x here in my case is just the input uh, data, let's say the, the input pixels of an image. So this is a very large variable, which can be you know, a very complex, a very high entropy. And, and y is the desired label, which usually, which usually I know without the network at all, so I put it to the left of this uh, variable, and essentially, there's some sort in the world of a joint distribution of X and Y. And when I train the network, I actually sample this joint distribution, actually get a very small sample of this joint distribution. And then this uh, miracle of, of, of deep learning happens. Essentially, we take the input, and through these adjustable weights between the layers, we move them through a cascade of representation transformation in the layers. So H1 is one random variable representing the whole first layer, H2 is one random variable representing the whole second layer, and so on. And eventually, in the last hidden layer, which is HM in this case, uh, the data becomes simple enough in a sense that I can, with just linear hyperplanes, or linearly separate the label and get this Y hat, which is an approximation to Y and it stands to the right of this chain. Now, I just want to emphasize that this is a Markov chain when the weights are fixed. I mean, once the weights are 
trained or fixed, this is just a cascade of representation. Each one can be calculated from the previous one. Of course, from during the training, you have this feedback through the error minimization algorithm, whatever, back propagation, or whatever it is, and that essentially connect and, and, and makes a lot of connection between the layers and the weights. But once the weights are fixed, this is a Markov chain representation. And I want to think about it essentially in two simple analogies. Think about the layers as, as some sort of telescopic tubes. I mean, each layer is some sort of a taking the information from the previous one and then filter part of the information or change it. But because the information cannot increase when I move along such a Markov chain, I always lose information. So this is something very basic about the information. Information is, behaves a little bit like an incompressible fluid. I mean, essentially, after you compress it, you can only lose information when you move through this chain of pipes. Actually, this was supposed to be an animation. Some, it's, it's not working. But in principle, what the network is doing is changing this telescopic chain of pipes. So think about the layer as if I add like a pipe to a pipe to a pipe. They don't have necessarily to get narrower, but information cannot increase when I move through this chain. You can also think about it as a cascade of filters. Each one of them is filtering, let's say, part of the spectrum or part of some frequencies. And essentially, together, they just minimize information because they cannot do anything else. There's no generation of information in this, in this cascade of layer. So that's a, an analogy which really helps me. I just want to make sure that you know what I'm talking about. So I'm, not, I'm going to characterize this information flow through the network by essentially measures of information. Uh, and I just want to make sure that all of you, not only my students, know these equations. I mean, so essentially, I need the two things. One of them is the scale divergence, which is essentially just the, the average log likelihood of two distributions, which is a very popular and very important measure of similarity between distributions. Uh, it has made many different meanings. What I really need is this mutual information, which is this average, is the uncertainty removed about a variable when I know another one. And if they're independent, this is zero. And if they strongly dependent, I get essentially the entropy of the input, or the, input, the entropy of the larger of the two. Now, of the smaller of the two, sorry. Well, one very important property of mutual information is what we call data processing inequality, which I just intuitively mentioned. Information cannot increase when I go along a Markov chain. OK, so if you all know that, I just want to remind you the main, the gist of this theory that some, some of us call the information bottleneck theory of uh, deep learning. It's actually, I just, I just call it a, it's a very, it's one, another perspective, certainly not a complete perspective, on how, how to think about these deep neural networks, which is really, in some sense, complementary uh, or even mirror image of the, of the talks we just had, especially from Shai and Andrew. I mean, both of them have echoes in my, in my picture, but I want to think about the large scale picture. And in the large scale picture, information measures like entropy and neutral information really become very important because of the property of information or entropy, which is called the typicality of symptotic repetition. Essentially, when the problem becomes very large, the entropy really governs the picture completely, and neutral information governs the picture. So the way I want to think about, I think about the problem is that each layer is characterized by two maps. One is what I call the encoder of the layer, which is essentially a stochastic map. It can be stochastic. It doesn't have to be stochastic, but it can be stochastic, or at least effectively stochastic, from the input to the layer. And then the decoder of the layer, which is a map from the layer to the output. And actually, I can also think about the optimal decoder, which is how much information there is in the layer about the desired label. And that's something I'm going to use all the time. And now, one of our main results, which is not formally stated here, but we can actually prove it formally, that, that when the, the, large, the pattern X becomes very large, such that I can restrict myself to typical patterns, and I'll say exactly what I mean by that. That's a technical term. It's not just you know, typical here. It has a very specific and very, very precise meaning. Uh, then, essentially, something miraculous happens, and only two numbers, the mutual information of the encoder and the mutual information of the optimal decoder, turn out to determine the properties I'm interested in, which are the sample complexity needed for a certain accuracy in generalization. Now, that's very surprising. I mean, there are millions of parameters here. Of course, a lot of people don't disagree with that. 
But if, if I'm right, it simplifies the problem tremendously. I need to follow only two numbers, and eventually they tell me the asymptotic story of the network. Now I'm going to not prove, but try to illustrate why I believe that this theorem has merit. So what you see here is something which I call the information plan. If only two numbers matter, so essentially it's the information of the decoder of the layer, uh, the encoder of the layer versus the information of the decoder of the layer, let's plot them. And, it, and this is for a very small, very specific toy problem. I argue that this is true in general, no matter what the nonlinearity is, no matter what uh, the architecture is, eventually this is the type of course, details depend on the architecture, but the general behavior here is extremely general. It's actually even true for biology. So what I want to show, I really want you to understand this picture, although many of you have seen it already, I suppose. So essentially, again, the, the abscissa here is, is the information that a layer TI has about the input, the mutual information. Of course, in order to estimate it, I need to estimate, I need some sort of an estimation of the joint distribution. An estimation of joint distributions of, of variables in such high dimension is hopeless. So you need to assume something. Either take a very small problem, as we do here, and, and quantize it and, or, or digitize it, such that everything is just counting. Or use some other approximation, like adding noise to the weights, adding noise to the units, uh, assuming some other assumptions about distribution, so on. So in general, of course, estimating this mutual information is not a practical thing. I don't suggest it as a practical thing. But this is just a, a way of viewing, or you know, I call it an x-ray of what's going on in the network. Now, here the input layer is here at the top. It has all the information, which is 12 bits in this case, about the input, and also all the information about the label, which is one bit in this case. Because the input, I mean, my images obviously have all the information. So this is this uh, up, it's not plotted here, but the first hidden layer is the blue, is in blue, the second hidden layer is in yellow, and so on. The last hidden layer here is in purple, in, in orange. And uh, we did 100 independent randomized repetitions of the same architecture initialized with small weights initially, and then we trained them on randomized set of examples, in this case 80% of these uh, 2 to the 12 or 4096 patterns that we have. So it's a very small problem. That's one of the things that computer scientists don't like to do, but as a physicist I, I learned that small problems can teach us a lot if you understand them, or toy problems. Now when we train them with SGD, we see this type of picture which is always striking when you first see it. So essentially, what happens here, there are too many interesting questions that just this simulation shows us. So first of all, there is this very fast, relatively fast, I mean, look at the number of epochs. This is, this is the number of training epochs, uh, the number of time I cycle my, my data in a batch, batch mode. And you see that around 300 epochs, you get to this very interesting point where, first of all, all these 100 different neural networks seem to concentrate. I mean, they, they look very much at the same place. And actually, I argue, and I can prove it, that the larger the network, the, the more concentrated they are. So this is uh, already interesting. I mean, why do they concentrate? And of course, uh, the, the immediate question, is this a general picture? Do you see it for all networks? Do you see it for all architecture? The answer is generally not always. You can easily design networks that will not show this type of behavior. but. For many, many, including many real-life problems, MNIST, uh, CIFAR 10, convolutions, values, whatever you want, you see a very similar picture when you look at it in the information plan. So there are two really striking observations here. First of all, these numbers seem to capture something interesting about the learning. And they seem to self-average, as we call it in physics. I mean, they seem to concentrate or average over all the randomness, which is the initial condition in this case, or the order of, of, of which patterns are actually used for the training. And the, the next thing is that, of, okay, what do they mean? I mean, what is the information about the, the label actually tells us? What is the information about the pattern actually tells us? What does it relate it to? And I want to argue that in general for large problems, these two things determine the accuracy, sample complexity, trade-off. Now look that, after around 900 epochs, I get this very interesting uh, behavior, which we most of the time see, not always, by the way. <laughs> you can easily design networks where you don't see it that way. But eventually, they move upward, which means improving the information about the label, which I argue is exactly 
corresponding very tightly to improving generalization error. And at the same time, they seem to reduce the information about the input, which in this case seems to be something like forgetting the, and notice that all the layers are doing that, or essentially most of the hidden layers are doing it, even the very first one eventually. All, and, and during this, what I call compression of their presentation, the last layer eventually converts to a very good point, which is essentially one bit about the label, which is perfect prediction of the label, and essentially only one bit about the input, which means that all the irrelevant details, in this case 11 bits of the input, are eventually not represented or not captured at all by the last hidden layer. Okay, so we analyze, we said a lot, as far as what I can, I can, uh, I can, uh, Average this, of course, and, and you see this very, very pretty trajectories, in my opinion. I mean, so you see that all the layers somehow, somehow climb up, and eventually, so from A to C, you get this very fast convergence to something which I'm going to identify as a flat, flat minima, but it's not one minima, it's actually a canyon of many, many minima. It's a whole manifold of good solutions. And from C to E, you get this very slow diffusive like of behavior which eventually improve generalization and reduce complexity or reduce information about the input. So that's a story we've been uh, talking about for a long time. Just want to, the, out, to, just the, to, to outline the, the gist of it. So essentially, the reason these two values concentrate is because we are talking about models which are locally factorizable. That's very much like you know, Markov random fields in vision, or hidden Markov models in speech, or uh, Hamiltonians with bounded degree of interaction, or graphical models with, with as, some sort of a bounded degree and so on. All these, both the information about the input, information about the output, can be written as a log of a product or a sum of log of products, which eventually in the large scale limits that are conditionally independent, depend on some sort of neighborhood, so a pixel, is largely determined by some neighborhood around him. I don't need to look at all the pictures, all the pixels in order to predict uh, its value in most cases. Uh, a piece of sound is, or a sample of sound is largely determined by the neighborhood and so on. So, so all these models where you have these locally factorizable distributions, this is uh, partly an answer to Shai. Uh, at least th for this I know that I'm going to have this concentration of information in this plan, which is really nice. And because these things are going to self-average and they're actually going to be estimated uh, not in, in, in a very interesting way. The other thing, of course, is, is what happens when you have small samples. How does it look in this uh, information plan representation? So here you have on, on the right the 80% uh, of the data of those 4,096, and you see that very nicely the generalization is improving at this uh, compression phase. And eventually you get to this very nice location. The color code here is, by the way, time. So black is zero epochs and ten, the yellow is 10,000 epochs. But when you reduce the number of samples, let's look at this 5%, you see that it's under-trained and something very strange happened. If you continue the training, you actually lose information about the label, which means that you overfit if you want or you, you overcompress. This is precisely, precisely where early stopping can help you. Now, just to illustrate this, I, I'm going to show you two very interesting uh, visualizations that Ravid, uh, Ravid, who did most of the numerical work here, and, and, and many other things. And it's actually Ravid and Nova, I should have mentioned them, uh, who are really responsible for a large part of what I'm talking about. Uh, so what you do here is a TSNIP projection of the first hidden layer. During the same training that I just showed you, what you see here are 4,000 points, 4,096 points, which are labeled by color. So essentially, if the network gets the label correctly, it's either red or black, depending on which, which label. If it's incorrectly, it's yellow. I mean, if the probability of the label is less than half, it's yellow. What I want to show you is, again, the dynamics of the training. So this is what happens to the network itself. I mean, how do this representation change? Notice that I'm not talking about the weights here. I'm talking about the representation of the first layer, this vector of, of 10 or 20 units which eventually move in space. For each point, I have a point in space, and now I just project into two dimensions somehow. Uh, and just to make a, a long, this is actually not in epochs, it's a number of, I just, I, I'm going to accelerate it a little bit. If you, if you see that towards the end, those 
points really cluster very nicely. This is the first layer. And you see that also the labels are basically correct. I mean, it's hard, you hardly see it on the screen, but some of the points are, are, are black and some of the points are red, essentially 50%. And you see that after 10,000 epochs, which is at 70,000 updates of the weights, essentially I got this uh, salt and pepper type of mixture. <laughs> All the, the blacks and, 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 and reds are, are really set, uh, very nicely labeled. I mean, there's a very little error here, but they are highly non-separable, at least not in two dimensions. Maybe if I project it in some high dimension, they will be separable. But in two dimensions, it looks like there's no simple line that separates the black from the red. On the other hand, if, when, if you look at the, on, on the left here, you see the same la first layer, but trained only with 5% of the data. And notice that you get essentially the same type of clustering, at least qualitatively. But there are many, many mistakes, and eventually you get this garble reds are in some sense, blacks are in other sense, and many, many yellows are on. And actually, if I keep on compressing, which means keep on trying to, i show you exactly why there is compressing, uh, you, you see that they cluster, but they don't label correctly. Now, the intention is very clear. I mean, the first hidden layer is essentially the same dimension as the input layer, which means that if you think about it as hyperplanes thrown on my data, it's a very fine partition of my space of input actually way too, too rich. I mean, there are many, many cells there. Now, only very few of them are labeled in this case, only 5%. So many, many, many of those inputs are going to be mapped to empty cells and therefore not generalized very well. Now, notice the striking difference. What happens if I look at the fourth layer? So in the fourth layer, again, on the right is fully trained with 80% of the data, and on the left is only 5% of the data. And here you see something quite striking. I mean, it's the same network, just a different layer. So eventually, look at it here, you see that black and red separate. And if I keep on training, eventually blacks on, are on one side and red on the other side. But there's something else. You see it on both sides, by the way. OK, and that's the end of these uh, 10,000 epochs. You see the blacks, all the blacks are on the right here, and all the reds are on the left. But with the 5% of the data, you get this nice snake, but most of the points are not labeled correctly. Everything in the middle is yellow. And I apologize to Jaime if you don't see the colors, but this is, uh, nobody can see it. Okay, it's all right. Okay, so, uh, so essentially, and there's something quite striking in this picture. I start with something which looks like a very high dimensional projection. Essentially, space filling in this two dimension. And eventually you converge to a one-dimensional manifold in this case. So there is a dimension reduction of the data to very low, low dimensionality, which eventually is the secret of the story, in my opinion. How is this compression to low dimension, which is really this relevant manifold? That's the only thing I really need to remember about the data. Uh, how does it happen? This is layer number four. It's, all, it's high enough. Five and six are even simpler than that. I don't want to show them. OK, so again, I don't want to go through the theory just because there are many non-theoreticians here. I just want to, 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 just, to, to show you the, the highlight of the theorems that we can prove about the information plane. So first of all, the generalization error is bounded by the difference between the full information about the labels, which is one, one bit in my case, and the information in one of those layers, which I call T epsilon in this case, for a reason which will be clear in a second. And what is really interesting is that the dimensionality, the affected dimensionality of the hypothesis class, which is the f all the functions from this internal representation in any one of the layers. So think about internal representation as discretized. And this is the cardinality of t, this t epsilon, the cardinality of it, and the absolute value of it, is essentially the number of internal memory states, if you want, in this, in this layer. So first of all, for information theory, just using Shannon's type of typicality argument, and this is where the large scale of the problem comes in, this is exponential in the information. It's just the two to the entropy divided by two to the conditional entropy, and this is simply the two to the mutual information between the input and one of the layers. So the mutual information is governed the cardinality of the representation. This is mathematics, it's not, uh, there's no assumption here. And, and, and according to our bound, which I can easily prove, but I don't have time for this now, Essentially, 2 to the i 
acts like the effective dimensionality or the effective VC dimension, if you want, which is really striking. So essentially, I get a, a bound like this, which is generalization gap, which is the difference between training and generalization on average, is bounded by 2 to the i of the compression to the whatever representation I'm talking about, divided by the number of examples, plus something which is completely negligible for large problems, the log of the confidence. Now, uh, so this is striking in the sense that the dimension is exponential in the compression. So any bit of compression is essentially like doubling the data. That's very surprising. And, uh, and that's why this compression seems to be very, very useful. So anybody who tells you that there is no proof of the relationship between convergence, between compression and generalization simply doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, uh, let, me let me just uh, highlight again that this is just a review of the theory. In this plan, there is always a curve, which I call the information button a curve or the information curve, this black curve, which is the best you can do for this problem. It's a problem of data dependent bound. It, it depends on the joint distribution of x and y, but nothing else. And this curve is essentially a wall beyond which representations cannot be found, no matter if it's a neural network or the brain of the, or the brain of an alien, which we don't know. Nothing can go beyond this bound, and that's why it's relevant for the brain, because eventually, if I somehow manage to reach this bound, then I'm doing the best I can. What is really interesting is that, in some sense, if I have a finite sample, there's a big difference between what I call the empirical information, how much I think I have information from the training data, and the actual information, or the real information, which is this red curve. And you see that the higher the information, or the less I compress the representation, the larger is this gap between, and this is actually reflected in this uh, bound here, you see again this 2 to the i over m, uh, or square root of 2 to the i over m, and this is essentially this gap. So if I want to generalize from finite data, I must compress. Now, of course, now everyone will come and show me examples of, of networks that don't compress, like ResNets and RevNets and iRevNets and all sorts of toys like this. They always have this compressive part. They also keep the reconstruction part in order to go backward, but I don't care about this reconstruction part. The, comp the predictive part of the layer is always compressing. And that's something which I can argue about with anybody who is interested. And eventually we know, at least for these toy problems, but for many others, that the layers eventually converge to this optimal bound. Notice the scale here is highly stretched. I mean, this is from 0.98 bits to, to 1 bit. That's the top of the curve. It's a very, a very, a very almost flat curve, but I need this small stochasticity. You know, somebody discovered in iClear last year that the, Without stochasticity, the bottleneck doesn't mean anything. We know it for 25 years, but he wrote a paper, and it's all right. It, it has to be slightly stochastic in order for the whole thing to make, to make sense. And you see that the different layers converge to different points on this optimal curve, and the scatter here is this finite size effect due to these 100 layers that I just saw. So this is very convincing. Now, again, I want to show you two new things today. First of all, why there is compression. This has nothing to do with the nonlinearity, Andrew. It has nothing to do with the saturation of the nonlinearity. It has nothing to do with the, with the architecture or anything like this. It has to do with something completely different, which is, OK, so if you look again in this picture, this very nice uh, evolution in the information plane, together with the error, this is the trading error or the accuracy. It doesn't really matter. They are very similar here. You see something very striking, I don't know if you notice it, that the compression starts, I mean, this movement to the left of the, of the layers starts exactly when the error saturates, or where there's this knee in the, in the, in the training error, or the generalization error. And this knee means that, essentially, the gradients are small. The gradients of the error are small because the error is almost flat. It's not entirely flat, but there's still gradients. And the error still goes down, but most of the important part of the reduction of the error is in this uh, for 1% to 1 over a million. That's where you get the money, <laughs> or 1 over 10 million. So it's exactly this phase. And notice that this particular improvement in generalization happens in parallel to this movement to the left of the layers. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, 
striking in the sense that, first of all, it happens way before the saturation of the nonlinearity in this case. It happens also for ReLUs and even for linear networks, although it's harder to see. But this means that actually there are two different phases of training here. The first one is this very fast converger to a flat minimum, as I say. And the second one is this very slow diffusion. And I want to show you how this slow diffusion is actually improving generalization. So I used to say all sorts of wrong things like uh, converging to Gibbs distribution. I don't need this. Now, uh, of course not. I mean, uh, I listen to you. <laughs> but uh, so essentially what happens here is that the gradients move through two distinct phases. So this is really the gradients. And what you see here in solid line are the mean of the gradient per weights for each layer. And in actually, this is a, not an accurate picture, but it gives you the, the, right, the right idea. I mean, so, so here we actually accumulate the, the gradients, but it doesn't really matter. So essentially, you see up to about 300 epochs, this is a log-log plot. Up to about 300 epochs, the mean is much louder than the standard deviation, which means very clean gradients, highly hardly any noise. And from 300 to about 9,000, in this case, you get these much larger fluctuations. This is a batch to batch fluctuations. These are the, the fluctuations due to the stochastic gradient descent. By the way, you get the same phenomena for full batch for reasons which I can explain, but later on. The same noise in the, in the gradients. And this, and this noise in the gradients tells you that in this phase, from 300 epochs on, you're actually doing diffusion. I mean, if you think about Hocke Planck equation or something like this, the first one is a drift hardly any diffusion. The second one is mostly diffusion. So in this diffusion phase, something very interesting happens. If you actually look at the norm of the weights, remember that there's, there's no regularization here, there's no weight decay, there's nothing which actually is going to reduce the weight. If you just look at the norm of the weights, you see this very clearly two phases. In the first phase, the norms grow more or less linearly. This is a log-log plot again. As you expect from a drift phase, they grow linearly with time. And in the second phase, I, I don't know if you see it, but there is a very sharp change in the, in the slope of the curve. It goes from one, half to, to, from one to around one half or even less than one half, which is a clear indication of diffusion. So in the log SNR phase, we actually have this uh, random walks of the weights, which seems stupid. I mean, why should I do it? What is the benefit of this random walk? Nothing good can come from random walks. OK, here's where we are wrong. So uh, essentially, something very good can come from random walks. This is, by the way, just to convince you that we're not cheating. This is the blue line here is the signal to noise of the gradients. The green line is the exponent of the weights. You see that the weights grow linearly face first and then sublinearly. And uh, the yellow, uh, the orange line is actually the mutual information. It's a very noisy because it's a very small sample. I think it's only one network if I remember or read, or read can correct me. This is a cross entropy loss, but it's, it doesn't really matter. Now, yeah, I'm not sure I understand, but let me, let me go on, keep the questions to the end because I'm already behind time. So, uh, so essentially, I just want to show you. So, again, you see this very sharp drop in the SNR of the gradients. It happens exactly at the point where the layers start to converge. So there's a very clear correspondence there. This is way before the saturation of the unit, which happens here when you see these noisy gradients. This is where you get this uh, uh, saturation or, 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 uh, or uh, vanishing gradients effect. But uh, if you look at it as a function of the batch size, you see that it, it's, there's a very clear linear relationship between the mini batch size and the point in which the networks start to compress the information. And how I measure information, by the way, is completely irrelevant. Now, uh, you see here that the full batch, by the way, no, no stochasticity at all, is up there essentially on the same line, which means that when you train on the training data, on a noisy training data, the fluctuations due to the, the quenched randomness of the sample cause enough noise in the gradient to eventually lead to this, to this uh, diffusion also in large sense. OK, so now I want to focus on one, maybe the most striking phenomena that we observed already two years ago. And this is the fact that when you train the network with more layers, you see that the curve is moving from yellow to purple, which means that somehow it, I converge faster 
with more layers. Now, this is something we had to understand. And I, I, I just want to give you a little bit of the insight of the mathematics here. And we actually, together with Amichai and Ravid and others, we managed to actually prove it rigorously. So what happened here, let, on, look, let's look only at the linear part of the layer. And what I want to do is now estimate or bound the mutual information between the layer k and the layer k plus 1. And eventually, this is a bound on the, on the information between the input and the layer k because this is a, a Markov chain of, of pipes. Remember that. So essentially, what I'm saying is that the gradients are highly non-isotropic. The covariance matrix of the gradient is protected in some very few dimensionality along this relevant manifold that everybody is talking about, which can be just you know 10 dimension or 20 dimension when I talk about faces. And other, the other millions of dimensions that the weights have are essentially irrelevant, what, which means that the gradients are, there's no effect on the error. There's no effect on the error. I do essentially a flat random walk in those dimensions. So I just drew it in, in, in this very crude way, but so, which means that I can actually separate the weights into two parts. The first part is what I call the CCA, or it's, it's like PCA, but projecting to the relevant part of the, of the problem, which is what happens in this first phase. And then there's this delta W, which is this diffusion phase, which is a random walk in all the dimensions. Actually, it's not all. That's exactly why we have those uh, uh, patterns that confuse our networks, because it's not in all the dimensions, in almost all the dimensions, many of them, but not all of them. And eventually, this noise this diffusion process is filling up all the irrelevant dimension, but it's very well protected in the relevant dimension. And essentially what happens here, and this is, this is the only mathematics I'm going to show you today, is that the mutual information between two consecutive layers is, can be divided into a part which is related to the relevant variables, and another part which is related to this diffusion process in all the irrelevant dimension. And if this diffusion process indeed grows like power law, let's say square root of t, then I have this lambda i or a i are the, 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 the eigenvalues of the CCA matrix, and the lambda i are the eigenvalues of the, of the diffusion. And what I do here is I bound the mutual information by the capacity of this linear channel, which is essentially a Gaussian channel. And those of you, I hope, will know a little bit about the capacity of Gaussian. It's log of 1 plus the Singleton noise ratio. So in every one of these dimensions, I get this half log one single tonoid dimension. I can diagonalize it in the, in the dimensions of the CCA. And eventually what I get is this very interesting relationship that the information within two layers in the linear part, it is independent of the nonlinearity, is going to decrease by, it's going to converge by, to the constant, which depends only on the relevant dimension of this layer, plus something which is a power law t to the minus alpha r, where r is just a trace of my component, this is a, a bounded number. It's actually a very interesting number, but I don't have time to get into it. And alpha is just a diffusion exponent, so it's, it's one half in, in this case. But this really has a very striking consequence. If all this story has any merit, then the time to converge with k layers should scale like k to the one over alpha, minus one over alpha, but alpha is the diffusion constant, times the time to converge with one layer. So this is really a very simple and very striking prediction. Forget about information, forget about gradients, just measure the t number of iterations that it takes to converge to a certain performance. And that's exactly what we did. And for this toy problem, you see this very nice power law, again in log-log plot. This is the number of iterations, this is the number of hidden layers, and you see almost a perfect straight line with a slope which corresponds to a diffusion constant exponent of, of 0 0.55. So this is striking. More layers, faster convergence. So how does it happen? So intuitively, it's very clear. All the layers have this diffusion in parallel, and because of this Markov chain property, they push each other like a train. So if you do the diffusion in parallel and the diffusion is independent, they're going to boost each other like, you know, like the, the, the expanding universe. I mean, <laughs> every piece of it is expanding. And eventually, you're going to get this very nice uh, boost of, uh, with, the, with the number of layers. And that's actually very, very interesting. So more layers converge faster. That's what I call the big observational benefit. By the way, if you look at some real problems, this is MNIST. Same question exactly. 
you see again this uh, nice parallel, although here the exponent is, is not as nice. It's 1.2. Okay, but you get parallel, which means you, you improve, you converge faster with more layers. Okay, and again, by the way, here you see again those, the, the, the magnitude of the weights for each one of the layers, and you see this very clear change of exponent when you converge to this flat minimum, and then when you start to diffuse in this flat minimum. So that's something I, I don't think that other people have seen before, is essentially this diffusion or this uh, random walk in the weights is doing two very important things. One of them is reducing or allowing me to ignore the irrelevant details of the problem, which is extremely important for generalization. I don't care if my image is on one background or with one illumination. There are infinitely many irrelevant attributes which the network has to get rid of. And that's done by just diffusion, and simply because the diffusion in the irrelevant dimension is faster than the diffusion in the relevant dimension, I get this very nice uh, forgetting of the irrelevant things. And the other thing is that it also boosts the convergence, which is really a so nice surprise. So I know I'm, I, I know I'm out of time. Yes. <laughs> I, I just want to uh, tell you a little bit of what, what we are doing now. Although some people already buried this theory, it's actually very li alive and kicking. Right. Yeah, I know. And uh, <laughs> what I want to show you is that there's more, there are more surprises here to it. So first of all, there are some critical points when you get to very high generalization, and it doesn't matter if it's your brain or if it's deep learning, whenever you get to high generalization, you must slide near this information curve. This is, this is you know, a mathematical necessity. There's no way around it. But once you are near this information curve, the theory of the information bottlenecks is the theory of the network. And what is really interesting about the theory of the information bottleneck is you can predict a lot of things about it. In particular, we know exactly what are the critical points along this curve where the, there is this critical slowing down and the convergence become very slow. So I'm not going to get into it because Chaim is going to kill me, but there is a full theory of the convergence time as a function of the distance from the critical points of the bottleneck problem. So essentially, this, the fact that the network is actually pushing the layers, the SGD or similar algorithm is pushing the layer to the curve, and they're pushing it to the left in order to generalize, is giving me a theory which depends only on the distribution and the sample size of where, where I'm going to slow down my convergence. So that's where we are going now, and I have no time, so i just summarize. Sorry, I actually wanted to say something about it, but next time. So first of all, only two numbers per layer really matter, whether you like it or not. And there is a theory which depends only on the rule, not on the architecture, which determines the optimal performance of the problem. In these particular cases that there is factorizable distributions and I can make all these information theoretic assumptions. The advantage of the, the layer, in my opinion, is mostly computational, it's not expressivity. <laughs> I mean, as we saw, I mean, very few layers are already expressive enough. But because I converge faster, I actually gain a lot by many layers. So it's a different aspect of the, it's not the only benefit, but it's an important benefit. And of course, there are many, many aspects that come from this, uh, this merge of the information bottleneck uh, theory to the neural network, which really tells me exactly how the layers are going to look, at least for some toy problems. Uh, but there's a high symmetry, and where I can actually make the separation of the layers. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Tali.